Hey everybody, welcome to the Linux Cast. I'm your host Matthew Weber. I'm joined by Martin Burt. Hi Matt. How are things for you? Um, well, my country's burning. <laughs> my country's going to hell, man. I'm going to have to emigrate to the United Kingdom or Canada or something. This place is falling uh, apart. Uh, you remember, said about that the better. <laughs> you remember the last show we did in 2020? We said 2020 is over. It's going to get all better in 2021. That didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> all right. No. Nope. So, Martin, screw politics, screw all the other stuff going on in the world. What have you been yep, doing in Linux lately? Right. So, I've been trying out Lineage OS on the Pi 4, um, just for something to try out, basically. I've ne- never actually tried the operating system for Android. Um, jury's out at the moment. Uh, just need to get a few things sorted. I think it's mainly my setup with my mouse, maybe the power, and I definitely need to overclock the Pi once I get a fan for it. I suppose I could stick a PC fan on it with a 9-volt battery, but I really can't be bothered. (laughs) How about yourself? What have you been up to? Oh, multitudes of things. So. Oh, sounds good. So I've been looking for an alternative to Caden Live that I used at the videos. Um, I've not been successful. I tried something called... Flow blade, something like that. It, it was it was atrocious. It was it was not good. Um, I'm gonna look at a couple other ones. Uh, I've also been struggling with PyCon. So for about the last um, I don't know two months or so, every time my monitors wake up, the screen flickers like a seizure thing. It's and I have to kill PyCom and re- start PyCom in order to get the get it to stop. So. I'm thinking that I'm going to have to go through and finally do a uh, nuke and pave on this computer because I don't have. I've tried uninstalling PyCom, tried using the default configuration files for it, um, and it just keeps happening. So there's something on my system that's causing that to happen. I filed a yeah. bug, bug report, but I um, nothing nothing ever came of that. So I'm not sure what the hell's going on with that. So, but I've been trying also been trying um. In, in that vein, I've been looking at something called Arch Labs Linux. It's basically just an Arch installer. Um, and I think if I end up do having having to do a nuke and pay for my main system, I'll probably try that instead of Arco. So give me something new to, right. new to do. Anyways, you that been, is... Uh, for your, say oh, it again, sorry. Martin. Uh, you have been trying out for your audio and video, video editing that DaVinci Resolve 17. I've never tried DaVinci Resolve. I I have been trying to find the open source ones. But oh probably, right, yeah, true. I, but I'll probably end up trying DaVinci Resolve. Uh, you know, some people use Blender to edit their videos, and hmm. just opening Blender makes me confused. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's a lot there's, going on. Yeah, there's not a application out there that's more confusing than Blender. I'm not quite sure how people would go about you know editing videos, and I just I don't know. I don't need all the bells and whistles. And Kaden, well, Kaden Live is good. I just, I don't know. Yeah, I was just looking for something new. I always like changing new stuff. Anyways, so <laughs> if uh, you want to get in contact with us, you can do so uh, on Twitter at the Linux Cast. Uh, I'm at MTWB on Twitter. Martin Smart and Twit to you. You can find these links in the show notes description. Uh, it'll be easier just to click on things. You can subscribe to us at the Linuxcast.org. This coming week, there'll actually be a website at the Linuxcast.org because I'm going to do a video on Hugo and we'll, I'm going to put it at a, on a GitHub page. So that should be fun. Um, you can also contact us via email at the Linuxcast at gmail.com. I know I've said that I'm going to create an actual email address for us. I've not done that yet. <laughs> Someday <laughs> I will do that. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Linuxcast and make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube where you'll find uh, daily videos on FOSS, open source, Linux, window managers, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and you can find that link in the in the show notes as well. So uh, each and every week we do... Uh, a couple links of like newsish kind of stuff, and then we have a main topic and some pick apps of the week. So we're just going to jump in. Uh, Martin, what's your first? What's your link for this week? Right, my first bit of news is from um, it's Foss News, um, and it's the title of the headings: Guess who contributed the most to Linux kernel 5.1 development? And you'd expect it to be Intel, but no, Huawei. 
Huawei. He's up Hu- there. Huawei. Huawei. <laughs> Huawei. Huawei. I think it's Huawei. Yeah, it's Huawei. Huawei. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know that until I listened to podcasts, and I still get it wrong like half the time. So I'll I don't blame never get it right, I don't think. Right, so Intel's been leading co- code contribution um, for the development of Linux kernel by the number of chain sets or number of lines changed. However, Huawei <laughs> has been <laughs> making a notable contribution, possibly due to them having several products and services that rely heavily on Linux, and they've also got the cloud services. But um, just a just the headlines really from here. So chain sets Huawei was fourteen thousand three uh, fourteen hundred thirty four. Intel was twelve hundred ninety seven. Lines changed by Huawei was ninety six thousand. Uh, but sorry, line. Lines changed by Intel was ninety, well, just under ninety-seven thousand, and Huawei was forty-one thousand. I mean, there is a table with the various companies have made the contributions, which says a lot about the strong effort that they are putting in into the Linux kernel development, which can only be a good thing. But there's a whole list. Obviously, your, your main players are there. Um, Nvidia's dragging the heels a bit, but. At least they're contributing something. But um, the link to the page is in the show notes, if anyone wants to check that out. How about yourself, Matt? What's you, caught your eye? Oh, sorry. I was just to say, do you think that there's going to be any um, kind of pushback? Because there's that whole Huawei's a Chinese company, and they're obviously in cahoots with the Chinese government. Well, of thing. course, it goes without saying. At, at the end of the day, it's all open source and it's open. There's no proprietary, so so anyone can go through the, the lines of code, which, yeah, to be right. fair, I'm sure Intel and a number of people are. But at, at the end of the day, it's only going to make, um, it, if they get the foot in the door, so to speak, of development on the Linux kernel, they can only just make the software run that little bit smoother and faster. Yeah, I agree. At the end of the day, that's all I can see. What's caught your eye recently? All right, so um, I did a video on this earlier uh, this week, actually. Uh, Linux Mint 20.1 uh, Ulyssa was available for download this week. Uh, and interestingly enough, I really liked it when I used this. So uh, that whole Linux Mint is useless thing didn't, didn't last very long. Um I, I, still think I, I did see you enjoying it, actually. I was watching your little face in, enjoying the Linux Mint. <laughs> you would. I, I still think I'm going to prefer the Debian edition, but there were some things that su- really subscri- subscri- sub- sub- surprised, surprised me. Um, for one, I've decided that I'm going to change to Nemo for my uh, um, visual, my GUI file manager, only yeah. because I can hide that the 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 file bar menu and get it back because I've been using Thunar for years and years and Thunar is the file manager for like Mate and I believe it came from Gnome too but the uh, when if you hide the file the file edit view buttons up there at the top you can never get them back unless you delete the application and reinstall it it's a pain in the the, the rear end um, so right. just for that one reason, I think I'm going to start. To, I mean, it, it's weird to review an operating system and have that be the uh, thing that you take away from it. But Martin, maybe you can. Ex- and, and this is going to be kind of jumping in on your uh, app pick of the week. But why are they spending resources making an IPTV uh, thing for Linux? I'm so confused about that. I mean, I understand that you know if they just want to do that like as a side project. But this it was like they were target as a feature of Linux Mint. To be sure, um, I mean, I put down this app of the week for some of the guys out there that, that, that basically just can't be asked downloading Mint to check it out. I mean, obviously anyone can search, but um, I put it on there. I mean, I, I did search for other streaming services. Um, there just wasn't any. I did find a couple, as you do, delving on a couple of pages in from Google, but uh, um, well, it was basically pirated stuff, to be truthful. Um, I can't see the point of it because I've I've bought up from been bought up from streaming from XBMC, which unfortunately got rebranded to Kodi and absolutely exploded, and everyone was selling Amazon 
uh, fire sticks and things like that with all the pirated things on and everything and absolutely ruined it. But I mean, code is fine for your streaming of television and stuff like that that you can install. But it, yeah, I can only guess it's, it, it's it, a small it just, it just team seems, maybe that's doing it. It, 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 it is seems, pointless from my eyes. I, it just I, seems I, weird, right? I don't, don't, know, about, don't know about your guy. Uh, what you could get on your TV. I mean, I didn't bother changing my, an IP to USA. I mean, whether it's um, content controlled or whatnot, or you can try and watch some BBC programs. But uh, there wasn't a lot on there for, for the UK. A couple of I was astonished free that, to air. I was astonished that the Weather Channel was on there because the Weather Channel here, at least here in the United States, is a cable. F- thing you have to pay for it like how do you get the weather channel on this free thing I, it didn't make any sense to me i don't know I, that was the most uh, of that review is the most confusing thing that was new in linux mint was that iptv thing because i just like this doesn't it, fit it doesn't i mean why are, it, they must it, have it, serious I, amounts of development time on their hands if they can waste time on that kind of stuff i mean it just doesn't you know i don't know at the end of the day you can get um VLC and is it the MPU three or something and pull the streams into VLC? That's what I yeah. used to do years ago on a Windows, and you can get all your streaming television on that um, free view or cable. To be truthful, depending on what sites you drop on, but I think it might just be a catch up. We've got ninety six channels. You might actually like one of them. Yeah. That's what oh, just, my takeaway was for the B, um, UK channels. Anyways, there'll be a link in the the show notes for anybody who's, who's interested in knowing what's new in Linux Mint. Um, I'll be I'll be interesting to see because this is based on the la- the last Ubuntu LTS. I'll be interesting to see what the Debian edition looks like because I'm really much more interested in the Debian edition. Although I will say one thing that in my video about how I didn't really care for Linux Mint that I didn't really take into account in terms of different differentiation is that I talked a little bit about snaps and stuff in that video, but really what Minute focuses on is Flatpak. So it's really kind of like you're using Ubuntu, uh, but instead of having snap shoved down your throat, you're having, you, you know, they're focusing on Flatpak. So that's, I guess that's one differentiation that I didn't really think about. Anyways, Enough about and you like the web apps. You like the web apps, didn't you? Oh, the web apps thing. Yeah, that was cool. But I don't think that that's new. For, I think that's. I mean, they no, did a new no, implement, I, I implementation it, of it, it, but there's like something like called um, Flux. Or, it was ice ice apps as well on Peppermint. It, it was a app yeah. I had previously. It's ideal for just sticking YouTube on it. Log into YouTube, stick your subscription, save it. Just open up YouTube to your subscriptions without Google spying any more on you. Yeah, That's it was all cool. I ever do, just stick it in one of those. Nice and easy. Anyway. Um, yeah, all right. So our main topic this week was Martin's, and all I know about it is we're going to talk about Linux file systems. So, Martin, what are we going to talk about? Right, it's just basically the um, basic file formats that you can format your disks or USBs. Um, I'll glaze over them because I think I'll send everyone to sleep, in, in, including myself, and I won't go through every single one because it's a fair few. Uh, so if I start off with the classic FAT32, which is obviously the file allocation table. So this is the older Windows file system, which can be read by Linux and Mac OS. It's, um, it's still used on removable devices, uh, digital cameras, Android phones, tablets. The maximal file, maximum file size is usually about four, is four gigabytes. And you can actually format them under Windows at 32 gigabytes. So if you've got your Windows, you can format your USB to 32 gigabyte. But larger volumes can be created with other tools if you're on Windows or other system. And I mean, it can increase to two terabytes. I'd love to see that day. We've got a two terabyte USB, but there you go. And theoretically, 16 terabytes. So, I mean, it's ideal, your FAT32, if you've got a 32 gigabyte stick. I mean, we've all been there before. If you've got a 64 or you've um, downloaded something on one computer, gone to move it with a to p- plug your USB stick into a television, it's possibly because you're on the wrong, um, formatted it to the wrong file system. So, ideally, if you cross compatibility, FAT32 is the way to go. 
Next one up is the NTFS, which is New Technology File System, which was used as a follow-up to FAT32, which has been used since uh, Windows XP and is uh, usable on Linux. And it can be used on USB devices over the 32 gigabytes. Um, the good thing about NTFS is it does use a journaling file system, so that'll help rebuild um, if you've got a power outage or data co- corruption help rebuild up the data can we pause um, there for so, just a second yep i want to say something about ntfs oh go on <laughs> carry on um so i i do i have a, a windows partition and i have my external uh-huh. hard drives for, for a format as ntfs so that they both yep. can you know whatever but did you know that you cannot control uh permissions on an ntfs drive it's completely open what is that 777 that's completely open uh to everything if you if you're using ntfs on linux like there's no uh closed permissions on it at all and you can't change them even with sudo um all right yeah it's really weird because i i came across that because remember I think it was like november or something of last year i was talking about how i was trying to get jellyfin to work or something I think that Jellyfin's the alternative to Plex, right? Um, I was trying to get that to work with my music thing, and my music's on that NTFS drive. And because of those really odd-ass um, permissions, it can't work. So that that was just my little rant. You can continue on. No, no, carry on, carry on. Good to know. Um, fortunately, as far as I could see, um, NTFS does not work on Android, but... I don't think you'd bother with it as an external, to be fair. Next on, the Linux favorite, EXT4. So it's obviously the default file system um, on the majority of Linux distributions now. And it is faster. Yay. Windows and Mac doesn't support these file systems. So if you need to, you'll need third-party um, software or various tools. Mm-hmm. Um it's often ideal to format your Linux systems partitions as EXT4 and leave any removable devices, as I said earlier, FAT32 or NTFS, if you need compatibility with the other operating system as described earlier. So, I mean, we all use EXT4 unless you actually use BTRFS, which is the next one, which is also known as Better File System. B3 file system, ButterFS, 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 B3FS, and I think that's about it. It's just ButterFS in my mind, really. It's easier. Um, So it was designed originally by Oracle, but other major companies have since played a part in development. This list includes Facebook, Netgear, Red Hat and Suze. I know um, it had a bit of bad press, ButterFS um, previously, but I know Facebook had still been using it all the time because of it, it, its real uh, reliability. So, I mean, the file system is aimed at better reli- reliability and scalability, offering higher fault tolerances, easier administrating and obviously the journaling. Taking snapshots on your system super quick and easy. So I mean, I think it also it also. So if you've got some people have like RAID drives and, and things set up, this obviously can read all your drives as as, as one uh, ButterFS volume. Also, I mean, at the moment it, it it isn't the default on Linux dis- distributions, but it, it possibly will replace EXT4 one day. Doesn't with Fedora, the goal, I, I think open yes, system. yes, dude. Right. I think uh, Debian's got support. Fedora does use it. Gen two, and I'm sure um, um, Arch has got support for it also. Yeah, I'm not sure. Sh- I'm actually one hundred percent not sure. Yeah. I- um, I know Fedora, Fedora was one of the big guys that are just, I, I think with their new release, whether the, the one just gone or the next one, that they're just moving to the ButterFS. Yeah, the the 30 or whatever moved or moving to it. All right, so Arch does does support ButterFS, but it's unstable. So it's, um, uh, I don't know if I'd use it or not. I, 
What about what? So what's the? Are you are you gonna cover Z? It was ZFS. I was, but I didn't want to bore everyone to death, so I was going to try and keep it short. It, if need be, we can c- cover so, some of the others. Um, because, because ZFS is the um, one that Ubuntu has chosen to throw their weight behind. Um, you can install that directly from the the installer. Um, unlike, you know, like I'm pretty sure ButterFS you could probably use on on ubuntu as well but you'd have to yeah yeah go through like gparted or something in order to do it but yeah once you set up your magic your partitions yeah zfs you can actually go through and do right from the installer and arch does support zfs so zfs is kind of like butterfs but newer i think um interestingly it was also developed by oracle hmm uh so you know that's uh, that's interesting um, so, I mean, you just use ext4 on your Linux systems, right? I mean, yeah, you don't do anything special. I, yeah, I'm the I same. think I did. Tr- I tried the ButterFS the once. I think it was the fact that um, I was taking um, snapshots of my system. I forget which which system it was, and it, and it said um, you can even, if you've got a ButterFS, you can use this. And I thought, and I'd looked into it, and, and snapshots, I think. Uh, are literally instantaneous instead of taking a massive uh, copy of everything it just literally takes a snapshot which mm-hmm. is ideal if you're dealing with uh, vast amounts of data or, or or you are backing up literally two or three times a day for it just to take quick snapshots in the, in the background i mean that, that that's perfect you could control the amount of snapshots like yeah. anything else i think it was time machine i was using i think and that gave the option of um, if I had a butter face to take the you mean, system snapshots. You mean with time shift? You mean time shift? Time right? shift. Time yeah. shift. Sorry. Time, time machine's the Mac one. Yeah. Um, oh. uh, so I can understand the the draw of the instant snapshot thing, um, but for my personal use, everything that I need to back up, I either back up on a external hard drive just using rsync, and that does incremental upgrades as well. Um, or, uh, I just like my configuration files and stuff, which this is, I guess the stuff that I, uh, really need because it's on, that's the only stuff that's on my main hard drive. Uh, yeah. I just use Git. I just upload to, you know, up to a GitHub using Git and Git also does, you know, incremental upgrades stuff, I guess. So, um, I'm not quite sure what I, I, I guess time shift would be good because it's like, um, it's like a GUI application so you can. You know, set your schedules and stuff, and it would just do it automatically. I where whereas I had to be the complicated nerd guy and actually write a cron <laughs> job in order to do it. You know, so I mean, you want to expect like your average Unix Linux users to even know how to use cron uh, without uh, no. you know, looking it up. So I no, always I mean, had to choose the hard way. Yeah, I've got burnt boy backups before. I mean, to, to tell you the truth, I, I don't really bother with snapshots at the moment. I've literally got a, a spare drive. Um. Every week or so, if I've got uploaded any pictures to my drive or anything like that, I just do a um, standard home directory copy over and, and just keep it on my spare drive. That's what I'll do. Um, but and the next one, if you can count it, I mean it's still a Linux. Um, is your swap file? So it really isn't a, a, a file system. It's basically a partition formatted as a swap from the memory to the disk um, it's just swapping space by the operations um, operating system exactly like a page file in windows obviously if you turn the computer off it, it's volatile so it, it it's gone and that was my quick whip through the main um, file systems of linux I mean, to be fair, it was quite interesting going through. I mean, that was on your whistle stop tour, but there's quite a lot of information. I mean, butter affairs, I could probably do a, I could probably do a two podcasts on that. To be fair, with the history and uh, and the, the benefits of it, but there's always something bigger and better around the corner, like you said. ZFS is possibly the next one once they get butter into the mainstream. Yeah. So. I- 
EXT4 is going to go away eventually. That's the one thing about yeah. Linux, right, is that they move on from like, – I mean, obviously, EXT4 is, 4 is the fourth one, so they move on from these file systems you know, fairly qu- quickly. Um, XT4, though, has been around for quite a while, so it'd be, it'd be interesting to see which one. It's either going to be ButterFS or ZFS. It's really going to depend on... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that ZF... I keep calling it ZFS just because <laughs> that's what, what I hear everybody call it, but ZFS or whatever. Um, I think that that's probably going to be the one that actually like w- wins out as the default, mainly because most people use Ubuntu. Right, so I mean, the vast majority of people are gonna be, but the on the other flip side, that um, I mean, Red Hat's throwing their weight behind ButterFS, so that might be the one that goes to and be the one that's gonna be popular in like the server area or whatever. So, it, yeah, exactly. Facebook, Red Hat, mm-hmm. and all the other big players, they need something that's not gonna fail. I yeah. mean, for the average home use, I mean. I'm, Obviously, our drives die, SSDs die, but I mean, EXT4, people will still be using that for, for, for even more years to come because of, however they do do their backups, they'll just stick with it for your average user. I mean, we're, we're not processing huge amounts of data, but um, onwards and upwards with it. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure it would. Tip, once um, all the distro majority of distros started using either one or the other, everyone else will follow the pack, uh, and just a few people will probably um, mm-hmm. either choose to install EXT4 or. or well, I, even or, even if the like ZFS or ButterFS became default, EXT4 is still going to be part. I mean, you can still format your drive as EXT3 or two. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. so I mean, it's not, it's not as if those things are going to go away. That's the thing about Linux. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, is that you pretty much can do whatever you want. I mean, that's that's why we like Linux because you can do whatever you want. All right. Or just to... call. Oh, sorry. Or just no, call ButterFS EXT five. <laughs> It could be. You never know. Um, it, cause it, I mean, because honestly, when you read that out, they had like, like what six names for it. <laughs> they need to choose a name. Uh, that's yeah, bad marketing. I, I, I do like the butter FS because it's smooth as butter. That's what they say. Right, I think that's what. Yeah. That's what, but, yeah. Um, yeah. They need to choose a name. Anyway, so let's move on to the apps of the week. Martin, we kind of stole yours from earlier, but you can talk a little bit more about. Uh, yeah, no, so we, we glazed over earlier. Um, Linux Mint um, 20.1's out. Um, a, a couple of new apps for it. One of those being Hypnotics, where you can um, watch, I believe it is streamed TV. I don't think it's, it's recorded and then streamed out. Um, I mean, the link's there if you want to try it. It didn't work for me on KDE Neon. I have had it working previously. Um, it, it's in the um, AUR as well. Um, Ooh, well, you got my attention. <laughs> I, mean, I thought, I thought so. So, I mean, give it a whirl just to say, yeah, I've tried it. I mean, I suppose it's fine for the odd news channel and things like that, but it's nothing you can't really search on YouTube, live n- news or, th- or things like that. Might be the odd channel that um, might be of interest for you, but going through it uh, for the UK channels. I think I saw BBC Scotland, uh, uh, the odd Sky News, but nothing really uh, caught my attention to leave it on my system, so I just deleted it, to be truthful. How about yourself? What's um, um, what's caught your attention? All right, so I've been using this for actually a while, and really it's less about the app and more about the functionality, because there's several clip, me- clip menu uh, or clip... Uh, clipboard managers out there so you can choose basically whatever you want whatever you know like suits your fancy um but i chose clip menu d and basically what this is is i mean everyone uses a clipboard control c control v all the time uh, basically sure. what this does is it just you know keeps a history of everything you have and you can put that into a, a menu system like you know rofi or d menu or whatever and it will keep all of your history so if you copied something like i don't know 
an hour or two ago or you know a day ago or whatever it's still in your history you can just navigate to that uh, and recopy it and put it as the in the forefront of your clipboard uh, it, it's really good if you go through and like say you know there's a whole bunch of links on a page that you need to copy you can just go through and copy all those it will just save them right to your clipboard and then you can move to wherever you want to paste them and use clip menu D to uh, paste them all without having to go back and forth back and forth back and forth um, it's a, it, um, it's clip menu D itself is not the easiest thing to uh, to set up mainly because you have to be able to uh, know how to set an environment variable um, but that's only if you're going to use it in conjunction with a menu system like uh, D menu or Rofi. Uh, you can also use it in the terminal. So you could just type in, you know, clip menu D, and it, all your your past history would then come up in your in the terminal. Um, I'm not sure, like, if there's anything else you could use it with. I'm not sure, like, maybe you could use it with like U Launcher or um, one of those, uh, like, was it Alfred or Albert or something. Uh, you, it's possible that you could use it with with one of those. Um, those actually may like I think like Alfred or Alfred, whatever whichever one of that is. I think that actually comes with a clipboard manager built in. So that's something. Um, I think that clipboard managers are just awesome, as you can tell. Um, I, <laughs> it's just something that I've uh, I've decided that I kind of can't live without because I'm always going back through and saying, oh, you know, I copied something earlier, you know, and, and you know, and I just need it, and it's easier than having to go back through. Firefox histories and try to find it. So that's my tr my pick. That's just opening my, up my keyboard. I can see me passwords and stuff like that. It's not very good. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> keep, like, yeah, it doesn't keep passwords. So if you if you copy from like a Bitwarden or KeyPass XC or whatever you use, LastPass, it actually won't keep that in there. It'll, or or it'll that's... keep it in there forever, however long the. Uh, you know, you know how like those passwords expire. It will also expire out of Clip Menu D, so you don't have to worry about them being saved uh, that oh, way. Right. Yeah, that's because I've never noticed them being actually just saved. Yeah, I, I never ever checked my clipboard. I just clicked on it and saw I got all my my passwords to log into the various things in there. So I'll copy and paste from one browser into another. You see, but yeah, sounds good. You got yourself yeah. a terminal command in in the end, eh? Yeah, well, I mean, come on. <laughs> St of course edition. they did. Of course they did. I mean, it, it would be against the rules if mine wasn't a, a terminal-based application. Yeah. I mean, of course. Yeah. Or, or Rofi or D-Menu. I always got to do something nerdy because I'm a nerd. I can't help it. <laughs> it's, it's just a thing. All right. That is it for us this time. Uh, I'm actually – let's see here. What are we cover next? Next, we're going to be talking about GTK versus Qt. Which one is better? Uh, I'm not sure wh where we'll come – you know, down on this one. It's possible that we'll both say that they're both good. Maybe we'll both say they're both bad. But I have some thoughts. I'm sure you'll have some thoughts, and we'll see you next time for that uh, discussion. See you next time. Excellent. See you later, guys. Turn up. <laughs>